in this the last episode in the series who is jesus i'm going to be drawing to a conclusion our findings to establish who jesus is and his purpose as always i'll be using the king james version bible and encourage you to follow along with your own bible we're going to start in first samuel chapter 15 and we're going to be reading part of verse 23 for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. OK, so I've already explained um, that Jesus rebelled in the previous episodes. You can check those videos. But we're going to focus here on this word witchcraft, which means divination. Divination, the practice of seeking unknown knowledge by way of supernatural means. It can also refer to false prophets and other gods. Witchcraft is a spiritual realm the servants of the God of Israel are forbidden from accessing as it sits outside of God's Holy Spirit. However, witchcraft is the very realm in which Christianity operates. Followers of Jesus believe themselves to be serving the Holy Spirit when in fact it's a much darker spirit they serve, one that imitates the true spirit of God whilst adding on its own unique and detestable practices. Okay, so if you take for example the idea of eating your God's flesh and drinking his blood, whether it be literal or symbolic, this whole notion of consuming blood is in direct contradiction to the teachings of the God of Israel. In addition to the consumption of flesh and blood, false prophets, fortune tellers, witch doctors of any variation, the demonic act of speaking in tongues and communication with the dead are all prime examples of witchcraft and rebellion. Okay. It's important to remember that whenever you step outside of God's Ten Commandments, you're positioning yourself in a state of rebellion against God. You automatically fall into a world of dark spirits and instantaneously become subject to the ownership of these darker entities. So when a Christian says, for example, the voice of God told me to do this or told me to do that, and then you hear a serial killer say, the voices in my head told me to do this and told me to do that. More often than not, those instructions are coming from the same place and they are there to remove you from your true purpose. Christianity is without question the very definition of idol worship and has been so incredibly successful in drawing people in because it gives you just enough of God, just enough truth to cause its followers to believe the entire New Testament is factual, when much of it is a lie. OK, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 13 and we're going to begin at verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. OK, let's just assume for now that Jesus performed all of the New Testament miracles that um, it says he did. OK, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. So it happens. OK, whereof he spake unto thee. So he said unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Now, Christians would obviously argue, but Jesus doesn't say let us go after other gods. But in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus says, I'm the mediator. He tells you to pray to him. OK, we've touched on this in the past. He's telling you, don't direct your prayers to God the Father, direct them to me. OK, that should ring alarm bells as it is. Moses never said pray to me. King David never said pray to me. They would never have dreamt of it. OK, so if he's saying go after other gods, and OK, you might argue that he's not, but he's saying pray to him. And as I've shown you in other episodes, it's not as clear cut as Christians would like to believe it is. OK, um, which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken, you shall not listen unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. OK, why? For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
even if the individual is getting everything right if he says pray to anybody else apart from god the father do not listen to him god is testing you for the lord your god proveth you to know whether ye love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul this is a test okay just because you might be in christianity doesn't mean you were meant to stay there okay maybe there was something to learn maybe that's your path we all have our different paths but it doesn't mean you were meant to stay there it's just god testing you to see whether you'll search for him because as we know says in isaiah god hides himself okay let's read verse four ye shall walk after the lord your god and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave to him okay you shall serve god cling to him and keep his commandments okay he's been explicitly clear here i'm just testing you that's what it is i'm just testing you to see if you'll go with the first person who makes you feel good okay now combined with the fact that many christians neglect to study the old testament god's holy word is the issue of their pride and arrogance Christians are always, and I say this as a former Christian, by the way, so I'm not looking down my nose or anything like that. But Christians are always supposedly praying that the rest of the world will come to see things their way. As a former servant of Christianity myself, I know exactly what they see. And I also know what they don't see because of their outright stubbornness. I'm not saying all Christians, of course, but many. First Samuel Chapter 15, let's read verse 23 again. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Okay, you see this? God compares stubbornness to idolatry, which is exactly what Christianity and other religions are. Whether you're serving Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha or some other idol, it's all the same to the God of Israel. Okay? it's idolatry so who exactly is jesus christ this colossal figure worshipped all over the world well if you want to fully understand who jesus is he must be viewed in relation to the messiah his counterpart the man christians refer to as the antichrist let's go to ezekiel chapter 28 okay um we covered this in the first episode People can go back and watch it if you want to and see how that played out. But this is talking about Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 28, the first half, is talking about Jesus. We went up to verse 19. Okay, in that video I said I would expand upon a certain part of verse 18. So let's read the verse in its entirety first. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, this is talking about Jesus, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. Now we're focusing on this part here. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, Jesus, it shall devour thee. Now I'm going to show you how the information from the previous episodes fits together and how it also ties into the series I made called Israel, who's the Messiah, Israel and Jesus. So in the first Exodus, we know that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and by God's hand drowned Pharaoh's pursuing army in the Red Sea, don't we? Moses was a man born in Egypt. He served in Egypt and ultimately he helped to bring destruction to Egypt. So if God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18 that the prophet to come will be like Moses, how do we think that may look? Well, just like Moses, the prophet, the Messiah, is born in Egypt, spiritual Egypt. He's born into Christianity, serves Egypt and Christianity and ultimately brings destruction to Egypt and Christianity. When the God of Israel says, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, 
He's saying the Messiah will be born into your keeping, Jesus. He will serve you, Jesus, and will ultimately destroy you, Jesus. The same way Moses did Pharaoh, it's exactly the same format. The main difference is the Egyptians and those in Noah's day were destroyed by water. God said he wouldn't do that again, didn't he? And so this time he's going to destroy by fire. Okay? Which can also be referred to as the word of the Lord. Now, which well-known prophet destroyed by fire? A man God told us to expect in this, the day of his vengeance. Elijah, right? The large majority of people do not understand that Elijah is the Messiah. He is the symbolic David and the prophet like Moses. It's all one man. The forthcoming Elijah is the fire that comes out from the mist, just like Moses did when he came out of Egypt. It's exactly the same format, like I said. Now, as I said earlier, Jesus cannot be fully understood unless it's in relation to the Messiah who Jesus opposes and who opposes Jesus. The primary purpose of Jesus and Rome's New Testament is to stop the God of Israel and his chosen Messiah. It's not to help them. The New Testament is there to lead God's people astray. Essentially, it's saying you don't need to read the Old Testament. I'm the fulfillment. Just just look at this and pray to me. OK, that sounds suspect in and of itself, doesn't it? OK, so we've established that Jesus opposes the Elijah to come despite making several references to him in the New Testament. And we know how this all plays out in the end, because we've just been through it. But the question still remains, who exactly is Jesus? Well, my personal belief is that Jesus is the son of Baal, which some pronounce Baal or Baal. He's the serpent's seed. Okay, He was born a regular human being. And he was anointed by the God of Israel, which we covered in former videos. But through his rebellion, he spiritually attached himself to the workings of not only Baal, but all dark spirits that operate outside of the God of Israel's Holy Spirit. Like I said, it's witchcraft. My belief is that like Esau, Jesus's rebellion also had something to do with the knowledge that he was never destined to be crowned the king of Israel. Jesus even admits his displeasure at the royal robe and ring going to his debauched tear away of a brother in the prodigal son story found in Luke chapter 15 of the New Testament. The nagging question I had when the God of Israel finally led me away from Christianity was why did God allow me to put my faith Jesus and in Christianity? Why did he allow me to um, serve Jesus so devoutly in the first place? If Jesus isn't God, why allow so many people, just like myself, to be led astray by him for 2,000 years? For the answer to that question, we've come back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. For the Lord your God proveth you. For the Lord your God proveth you to test you to see how much you truly love him and the lengths you're willing to go to in order to seek his holy truth it is all a test of how much you're willing to seek him okay just because you're in christianity or islam or buddhism doesn't mean you were meant to stay there repent give your heart to the god of israel and abide by his ten commandments